All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to our third and final video in the aggregate supply side policies series where we're going to talk about um, some of the ways the government uses aggregate supply side policies to try and influence our productivity, our efficiency, and our productive capacity overall. So today we're going to be specifically looking at um, subsidies, infrastructure spending, education and training, and research and development, and some of the things put in place around that to help us achieve, achieve our domestic macroeconomic goals. Um, this may not actually be the last video. I think I might do another one after this later in the week, next week, looking at some past VCAR questions. So if you think that will be useful, check in for that next time. So first up, what we just talked about, we're going to be looking at these, this last point about how each of the following policies can help achieve the domestic macroeconomic goals. So these ones here, um, all in here, is what we're going to be looking at today. So first up, we've got spending on education and training. So um, when the government spends on education and training, the purpose is to improve the quality of human capital and therefore make labour more productive. So the government, in the government budget, this can be done in two ways. It can be done through capital spending, so it can be done by providing funds for new schools or university buildings or equipment, which can then help create more skilled labour in the future. So like if you spend more money on high schools that have better resources or better facilities, you're going to get um, more skilled students coming out of that and entering the workforce, and therefore they are going to be more productive as labour. It can also be done through current spending, so the provision of new training programs. Um, these get used a lot at the moment. Um, try and skill people up in areas we have skill shortages so that they can then become more productive members of the workforce and makes them more employable overall too. So a lot of education and training spending by the government is done to try and make people more productive, but also more employable try and make sure that unemployment rate remains lower. So with that, how it impacts the three goals. So with low inflation, if we've got a more productive workforce, it means you're going to be lower average cost for businesses because they're getting more output per unit of input. And therefore, that's going to reduce cost inflation because those lower prices can be passed on to the consumer. And therefore, that's going to be great for achieving the goal of low inflation if inflation is high. For economic growth, a more productive workforce leads to higher output and lower prices which in general, high production means there's more economic growth, there's high production compared to previous periods and greater international competitiveness because we're going to have more goods and services available at a lower price to help us compete with other um, businesses overseas. For full employment, education and training improves the employability of labor. So therefore people are more likely to get a job. This is happening a lot at the moment um, with all the unemployment being caused by coronavirus. There's a lot of government initiatives being put in place to skill people up in areas they are needed. So there is um, one thing I just noticed in the news recently, they are employing, they are training bank staff to be able to help the SES um, and ambulance staff uh, if banks were to shut, which is kind of interesting. Um, so they're able to help out in a different means and they don't get unemployed for that. Um, it also helps increase our international competitiveness creates more demand for labor, which reduces unemployment as well. So education and training successful helps achieve all three goals. So samples of specific education and training initiatives by the government. So the first one we're gonna look at is the delivering um, of the skills for today and tomorrow packages, which invests 525.3 million in vocational education and training, creating about 80,000 new apprenticeships and paying um, employers payments or subsidies of $4,000 per apprentice they take on. Try and incentivize businesses to take on apprentices because for a while they'll be taking on less, which is not great for youth unemployment. And also tries to create more jobs in the trades, which are going to be beneficial to the economy and beneficial to our productive capacity. Also investing $17.7 billion into the university sector in 2019. Um, by doing that, the university is going to be more able to provide high quality education to their students and therefore create better members of the workforce later on. Uh, also, we've got providing $4.5 million over four years from 2018-19 to encourage more women into education and careers in science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which is also known as STEM. So you might even notice at the school they have um, meetings for women in STEM. They probably don't at the moment because remote learning. Um, but those are designed to get um, women more interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics jobs, areas which have been primarily dominated by men in the past to try and get 
more women into those areas and those careers. Next on, we moved on to research and development grants. So research and development is spending by a business in trying to find technological advances or new ways to produce goods and services to either increase the quality or quantity of our production. So a little bit of a question for you to think about for a three seconds before I answer it for you. It's why wouldn't businesses conduct research and development without government incentives? So the reason they wouldn't do it themselves is because it's risky. There's no guarantee that when you do research and development, there is going to be a reward for that. You might conduct research and development and find out what you've been researching is useless. So the government puts incentives in place to make businesses want to conduct research and development, so they'll actually do it. And therefore, if it is beneficial, it benefits everyone, especially the economy, it benefits the government because then they'll be selling more, making more tax revenue for them, etc. So the government provides funding grants as well as significant tax incentives. So an example is you get a 100% tax concession on research and development expenditure. So whatever you spend, you can claim 100% of that back on tax, which is pretty great for a business. It means there's going to be no risk with that um, research and development, and you're actually financially better off by doing it. To ensure that businesses want to conduct it. So if we have successful research and development, it can affect the government goals in the following ways. So with low inflation, having better capital leads to lower average costs, reducing cost inflation, making the goal more achievable. So if research and development leads to better capital resources, that's going to be great for your average costs. Uh, economic growth, lower prices work to increase international competitiveness, which boosts aggregate demand and creates non-inflationary economic growth. So if this new capital, whatever you've done research and development into, does lead to lower prices, it can then boost the amount of sales we're making overseas and therefore increase our growth. For full employment, it creates more demand for labour, both in the short term via the researchers that you need for research and development, and then the long term via the increased demand created by that um, increased international competitiveness. So then that helps us achieve that goal of full employment. Some recent examples related to research and development are from the 1st of July 2018. The government will better target the research and development tax incentive towards businesses earning $20 million or more, which is that 100% tax concession means more businesses will be able to do research and development and then claim the benefits of it, like gain the benefits of it while also claiming that tax concession. Investing an additional 393.3 million over five years from 2017 to 18 in Australia's national research infrastructure facilities, so trying to get us better quality infrastructure, which will then benefit our aggregate supply in the long term. And also a $29.9 million investment to support the development of Australia's artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities. So um, try to put ro um, research into AI and robotics. To try and, so obviously that's going to take over a lot of manufacturing in the future. And if we are at the forefront of that, that's going to lead to greater production levels and greater levels of growth, greater levels of aggregate supply, greater efficiency and productivity. Then we've got investment in infrastructure and the macroeconomic goals. So infrastructure is probably the easiest one to talk about and explain when you're doing VCAR style questions. So if you're ever given that as an option, you should definitely run with it. Um, so infrastructure refers to the key physical or organizational structures within an economy that help economic activity take place. So things like roads, ports, electricity, telecommunications, airports, um, all these things that we need um, to exist in our economy to be able to function. A greater amount of infrastructure or increasing quality should lead to an increase in our productivity, efficiency, and productive capacity. I just use the example here of the fact they always seem to be doing roadworks in Victoria, and it's to try and get rid of what we call bottlenecks, which cause nothing. There's an example where if you are driving on the um, Western Ring Road towards the airport, there is a part um, just past Sunshine Hospital or Joan Kerner Hospital, as they're now calling it, um, where it goes from four lanes to two lanes, and often the traffic backs up there, and we call that a bottleneck. And eventually, that will increase the amount of lanes there, and that bottleneck will disappear. It's the same in our production. Investing in infrastructure means that any productive bottlenecks we have, so any points where we're not able to increase our productive capacity, can be alleviated because we are going to be more able to produce when the infrastructure is higher quality or there is more available.
For example, when the roads are better and there's no traffic, there's less travel time. So things get to where they need to be faster. So we're getting resources faster or we're able to get us um, goods and services to businesses quicker. It just makes things a lot more efficient overall and you lose less costs in transport. So how it impacts the goals. So low inflation, more or higher quality infrastructure leads to lower costs for businesses and ultimately less cost inflation. Basically the same answer as the others. With economic growth, lower prices or higher efficiency leads to an increase in international competitiveness and a boost in aggregate demand through increased exports um, and more sustainable growth in real GDP because we're doing it like we haven't actually, we're not using more resources to conduct our production, we're actually just using them more efficiently. And then with full employment, this one works out quite well in that the initial development of infrastructure requires labour to create. And when these jobs cease to exist when the project is completed, the increase in economic growth should lead to reduced unemployment as well as more jobs are needed to match that increased demand. So you look at things at the moment, like how they're doing the Westgate Tunnel or the um, train lines in the city. These infrastructure projects create thousands upon jobs. And although those jobs are only for a limited time, when those, that time um, elapses, there'll be other infrastructure jobs those people can move on to. But that new infrastructure and the improved infrastructure there will create jobs by the fact that um, because the infrastructure is high quality, we're going to have more demand for goods and services overall, and that will create more employment in the long term. So recent spending on infrastructure, we've got an investment on a $2 billion um, fast rail connection between Geelong and Melbourne, an additional $3 billion on to the Urban Congestion Fund, which tries to get rid of um, traffic issues in um, Australia. So things like what we were saying before about traffic bottlenecks or um, in Victoria, getting rid of all the level crossings and making them overpasses or underpasses. $2.2 billion to the local and state government road safety package, um, because if the roads are safer and there are less accidents, things are gonna be more efficient. $29.5 billion in equity to NBN Co to provide high-speed internet to over 12 million homes and businesses. If we have high-speed internet, we're going to be more efficient um, and more able to do business, especially now that everyone's working from home. We really need good internet to manage our day-to-day -day business with all the video calls, et cetera, that are occurring. Um, if NBN Co installs this to all of these places, we're more able to do business in an effective way and increase our capacity that way. And then so lastly, we move on to subsidies. So subsidies are a payment to a producer or a consumer that is designed to increase the consumption or production of that good or service. So you usually most famously see them with like solar panels. That's the most popular example that comes up. Um, the government has increasingly moved away from providing subsidies to businesses over the years, as it can often lead to less efficient production. What's tend to happen over time is as, um, the government gives subsidies to businesses to prop them up. They actually get less efficient because they know that if they run into trouble, run into trouble at all, the government will bail them out with more subsidies. And it leads to inefficient production and ineffective practices. And so the government doesn't actually use subsidies as much anymore, although we'll get to in a moment because of the pandemic, there has been a massive subsidy that has occurred recently. So impact on goals. So low inflation, subsidies lower the cost of production for businesses or the cost of sale for consumers, therefore lowering average price levels. With economic growth, lowers prices to increase international competitiveness, which lifts aggregate demand and economic growth. And for full employment, it increases international competitiveness, leading to more demand for labour and a reduction in overall unemployment. Um, because if businesses are getting subsidies, they're less likely to lay off workers because their costs are high, because their costs are lower, they can afford to employ more labour in that way. Um, and then we move on to the recent example. So the big example recently is $130 billion wage subsidy introduced in April 2020, although I think it ended up being um, $70 billion that ended up costing the government, which you've got to wonder where they got that so wrong. Um, to provide relief to businesses and prevent a huge increase in unemployment um, because of the JobKeeper package, many businesses were able to keep functioning but it also had a lot of other issues and what it created my favorite economic term of the year, which is zombie businesses, which basically was only still existing because they're being propped up by the $1,500 JobKeeper payments for their employees. And when um, 
businesses have to come back that was closed. So that's an issue. The government's trying to deal with this, um, but there are many, many issues around that. But that's a subsidy that's helped businesses keep operating and lower their cost of production through the pandemic. Concessional loans and cash grants to rural producers impacted by bushfires and, bush and droughts to um, keep them able to maintain their production. And childcare subsidy, which is means tested, which means that they take people's income um, to make sure that they're not, they're not benefiting from it if they earn enough that they can afford it. It provides financial support to reduce the cost of childcare, which helps increase the labour supply. So parents don't just stay at home looking after their kids, they can return to the workforce because childcare is affordable. So with that, all the content for Unit 4 is complete. Uh, Aristo 2 is really, really short now. Hopefully, if you found any of this useful, um, we will in future be able to do some videos about um, answering VCAR style questions, which sometimes will marry up um, content from different topics and go through that. Um, also, potentially a little bit of some um, strategies around responding to economics multiple choice questions because they are very, very tricky and test your ability to read sometimes more than your ability to understand economics. But I hope this was useful to you. If you have any questions at all, feel free to leave a comment below or email me. My email is in the description below. Other than that, I hope you have an excellent day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.